Well, um, welcome again. Uh, my name is Steve Lauer. I'm president of the chapter of the, the Charlotte area chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. This is our bi-monthly membership meeting, general membership meeting. Uh, it normally would have been held next Sunday, uh, but we moved it up for two reasons. Uh, first and probably more important, uh, the registration period for voting in this upcoming election and, uh, be, ends just a couple of days after this meeting would have been held next Sunday evening. So we wanted, given the, the fact that the topic tonight is voting rights, uh, we wanted to give more time for people to exercise their rights and to take advantage of the information they'll be hearing this evening. Uh, and second reason was next Sunday also happens to be uh, the commencement of the High Holy Days for uh, those who observe the Jewish faith um, and to avoid the complication that that would have created, again, we decided to move the meeting up to this evening. So thank you very much for uh, coming here this evening. The, um, the chapter has, uh, and I'll do my usual stick for a minute, uh, we have six civil liberties teams that we've organized uh, where most of the activity of the chapter occurs. Um, one of those is the team on protection of voter rights, and that team is the group that put together this evening's program. Each of the teams, in fact, is responsible for putting together a program over the course of a year. The other teams are the uh, team on uh, freedom of thought and expression, which is First Amendment related issues, uh, the team on immigrant rights, team on law enforcement oversight and accountability, and Brandy is also a member of that team, which is why she's going back uptown uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, the team on uh, uh, legal aid, and they help people who are in danger of eviction and informing them about their rights in that context. Uh, the team on LGBTQ rights and issues related to that. Um, so we have uh, the six teams and, and always looking for more volunteers, more activity. Uh, if, if you're interested, you can either uh, put your name on the sign-up sheet outside, which, which has a place for indicating which, if any, of the teams you want to get involved with. And otherwise, uh, obviously, feel free to approach any of us who are active in the chapter. We'll be happy to, to get you involved. Um, let me turn right to the program. We have two organizations co-sponsoring with us this evening, uh, one of which is Democracy NC, and, and the primary speaker this evening represents that organization. I'll introduce her in just a second. And the other co-sponsoring organization is the John S. Leary Bar Association, which is a group of black attorneys here in Charlotte. And we thank them very much. In fact, they uh, basically have, have provided a lot of the catering for this evening. There's a, there's a whole lot of food out there on the tables. And feel free to avail yourselves of that, uh, at least during the break. Um, and let me, let me turn it over to Mel uh, Hartzell from Democracy NC. Uh, Mel will be talking about uh, rights voters have, particularly in the context of this election this year, given the confusion that has arisen by virtue of efforts of the, uh, the state legislature, the pushback, you might say, uh, by the federal courts, and where things stand. So, Mel, let me uh, turn it right over to you, um, and uh, we'll talk again later. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mel Hartzell. Um, I don't usually speak in a microphone because I am a community organizer, um, but I am very happy to be here. And um, we're gonna go through um, a lot of things um, and I'll go through that agenda here in just a minute, or right now actually. Just say next. Oh, next. <laughs> um, so we're gonna start off with introductions about who I am and about Democracy North Carolina. We're going to do a little bit of history of our organization so you know who we are, um, and also history of voting rights in North Carolina. We'll go into the law, um, the voter integrity law, um, and the legal proceedings that have been related to that. We'll talk about the Board of Elections and what's been happening around those boards locally um, in the effort to suppress the vote. And we'll talk about what you can do to get involved in 2016. Next. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna try not to like keep turning around, but I kind of need that a little bit. So, um, 
At Democracy NC, um, we use um, organizing, advocacy, and research to make sure that people are engaged in the right to vote. We are a nonpartisan 501c3 nonprofit, so we don't uh, do anything with parties or candidates, but we do a lot of things that are issue-based. So we make sure that people are civically engaged, especially people who have been disenfranchised. We make sure that, um, or we work to decrease the effect of big money in politics, we make sure that things are transparent um, and increase voter participation and make sure folks are educated about the voting process. Next. <laughs> okay, so here's a little bit of our history, as you can see. Um, in 1970, the Institute of Southern Studies was founded, um, and our founder, Bob Hall, um, was the editor and founder of Southern Exposure Magazine. He came up out of SNCC, the Students Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, so it talks about, um, Southern Exposure talked about different politics in the South. They talked about uh, campaign money behind Jesse Helms v. Jim Hunt race for the U.S. Senate, which is the first time that um, there's ever been analysis of money in, um, in campaigning. Next. Um, Institute for Southern Studies gets grants from the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, who is also one of our founders, and it all kinds of goes, all kind of goes together. Um, in the 90s, the um, North Carolina Voters for Clean Elections was created by a dozen organizations. We are in existence as Democracy South at that point. Next. <laughs> And, um, and then we uh, changed our name to Democracy North Carolina um, in 2003 as we expanded from good government into some other activities. Okay, thank you, next. <laughs> okay, so currently some of the things we're doing are election protection and what election protection includes is um, poll monitoring, which is something that some of y'all have seen at precincts. We have folks who wear yellow t-shirts and have a hotline number, it's 188-HOUR-VOTE. So if there's any effort to suppress the vote or any problem at the polls, they can call that number. They're immediately connected to attorneys and law students who um, document that for research for lawsuits and also try to handle that as it's happening. Um, that can include anything from a long line at the polls to um, active uh, disenfranchisement. We have Souls to the Polls, which is an organization that connects our efforts to faith-based communities so that communities are encouraged to make sure their, their people are registered to vote. Um, one of the suppressive tactics that the North Carolina ha le legislature has used is to cut Sunday voting. Um, so in, in, in the African-American community, we know that a lot of folks went to church right or went to the polls right after church on Sundays. So that was a deliberate attempt to suppress the vote. So we try to get those communities um, engaged as well. We partner with the NAACP a lot on this. Um, we do early voting advocacy, meaning we work to fight for our early voting plans um, across the state that are fair and equitable for everybody. Um, we, monitor, we monitor our boards of elections to make sure that folks um, have representation because we know the boards of elections have a lot of power and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, we do a lot, so like, so we do. Um, we come, we connect with nonprofits. We're we're currently working with nonprofits across the state. Uh, locally, Crisis Assistance Ministry is one um, that we're working with, where we actually do voter registration. We don't do a whole lot of voter registration because a lot of organizations do it on the ground. Um, but this is a place where we are able to provide grant funding um, and then make sure we have volunteers uh, filling that need. Um, we do a lot of millennial voting projects and get out the vote and communications efforts with digital advocacy as well. Um, I actually am based out of Charlotte as an organizer and I cover the Western Piedmont, so I cover eight counties in North Carolina. We have five people who are like me across the state um, working in clusters of counties and any county that is not covered is covered by our Durham office, which is our headquarters. And I'm based out of Charlotte. My office is on Plaza Midwood and Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Next. Okay, so I'm not going to go into all of this, but Democracy and C has done a lot of things to get um, to decrease the influence of big money in politics, as well as to um, 
gain rights such as same-day registration, out-of-precinct voting, um, things like uh, the reasonable impediment, which I'll go into in a minute, but that's what people were using if they weren't, weren't able to get an ID after the voter ID was passed. Um, we worked for and won um, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, and we actually won man mandated annual registration drives in high schools as well. Um, we have improved access to voting for citizens with felony convictions also. So, um, next. Um, I'm going to try to do that less annoying next. Um, we have recruited and trained hundreds of community members to be um, precinct advocates, and these are people, the poll monitors, who stand outside and have created so much data from incidents at the polls that they were actually able to take that to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice as, as attorneys and the NAACP and the League of Women Voters. Um, to actually get that great ruling we had um, on July 29th from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, we were able to document the violation of the National Voter Registration Act. Um, so, uh, like the DMV wasn't doing their part in registering voters, so we've been able to document a lot of, a lot of um, discrepancies between the law and, and the implementation of the law as well. Next. Okay, and like I said, we've provided a lot of research and advocacy around the 2013 law to, um, to get that um, overturned, and, and it's in the, it's, its last form was appealed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but um, some of the stuff we've actually done is that in the 2016 primary in March, we had 700 poll monitors, and this was hugely important because those poll monitors were able to collect data across the state and really see that the, the what we call the monster voting law was um, implemented um, with discrepancies. It wasn't consistent across the state. The way that voter ID law was um, actually put into practice was different depending on what county you were in, what precinct you were in, um, and ultimately, um, in some cases, by the color of your skin. Um, we answered 1,200 calls to our hotline in March um, of cases of disenfranchisement or long lines. For instance, University City Library folks were out there until 10 o'clock at night um, in March. So we want to make sure that, that everyone has access to the ballot and are able to vote, and that's why we have attorneys on guard for that. Um, and we also build local coalitions across the state. We have one in Mecklenburg County um, where representatives of lots of local organizations come together and everybody's welcome. You don't have to be a representation of a local, a representative of a local organization. You just um, come. So, <laughs> that, oh, good. Um, and then we're gonna jump into some voting history. So this is really cool stuff. Um, and we're gonna start with this awesome video that Democracy North Carolina put together with the NAACP um, now. The vote is the most powerful instrument ever devised by man for breaking down injustice and destroying the terrible walls which imprison men with all of their weapons for others. Their people who died for the 
people who got a head field and had a bridge with the right to vote. We cannot turn back. We have to keep going. Top minute measure mandate that voters produce photo identification. 16 states have passed right after the variety of poll access laws. There is what looks very much like a coordinated effort among Republican legislators and Republican governors to pass laws making it significantly harder to vote. Democracy NC, the NAACP, and voting rights groups across the state believe that the new voting legislation is a response to the upsurge of minority and youth voting in the 2008 election. They're organizing to stop these measures from becoming state law. Merchants and white supremacists 
identified with the conservative party of the day, the Democrats. With support from the Raleigh News and Observer, the Democratic leader, Fernifold Sims, launched a relentless campaign to demonize African Americans and drive a racial wedge between them and their white allies. To break up the discrimination of progressive coalition, the white conservatives, they have a problem as they bring their participants from New York City to show images of the black beast slaves, the incubus of Negro domination. You know, which was this idea that, that you know, the clothes were better, black men yes to bat the box the more he was to us. White conservatives accused fusionists of voter fraud and government corruption. So they're creating this insufferable crime out there, and they're voting that out of African Americans, and they're using this as a way of justification to um, explain why Democrats need to retain control. And so these cartoons ran in pretty regularly in the newspaper, and you have to remember that not everyone in 1898 is literate, and if you couldn't necessarily read the entire newspaper article, you could see a cartoon and get the gist of what they're trying to get across in the paper. In the run-up to the 1898 elections, Democrats organized vigilante brigades called Red Shirts who patrolled the streets, menacing both white and black voters. The white leadership made a point to have business owners tell their employees, particularly if you were black or they were Republicans, that if you register to vote, you will lose your job. Democrats in that period are very open about saying, look, we, if we're going to live in time, make sure people don't vote. The Democrats swept the 1898 elections. Still, the Wilmington city government remained in the hands of the fusionists, but not for long. Wilmington was an armed camp. The Democratic Party leadership were putting guns in the hands of every white man they could find. They were giving them amnesty. They were putting them in rallies, and they were empowering them, and they were instilling this fear of African Americans in them. Tensions exploded over a bold editorial in an African American newspaper. A mob of 2,000 stormed the paper's office and burned it down. They started out in the morning uh, and marched troops into the black community and began to shoot it up, to fire, uh, to stand scrimmage into uh, the black uh, community, causing thousands of people to flee uh, their homes, lives, and rules. The conservatives then rounded up both black and white future officials. Five, six hundred uh, whites, all on, and they would bring in each elected official one at a time and bring them into the middle of the, uh, of the crowd and sit them down in a chair. And uh, was told, you have a choice. You can resign and leave, or we'll kill you.
1920, at the peak of the women's suffrage movement, Fernifold Simmons, still kingmaker of the Democratic Party, warned of a revival of fusion if North Carolina allowed women to vote. One congressman cautioned that, just for the sake of letting a few agitating white women vote, the women's suffrage amendment would enfranchise 110,000 Negro women. Tarpeel lawmakers refused to ratify the amendment, even as women want the right to vote in other states. Barriers to the vote remained until passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Again, there was a reaction from conservatives. But for the next few decades, thousands of Democratic office holders across the southern states fled their old party to become Republicans turned it into a nearly all-white political party. Now, I'm sorry that some of you had voted for friends in the past. I understand that. For House Bill 351, a bill requiring the voters to provide photo identification before voting. Today, there are no red shirts menacing voters like they did in the fusion years. But conservative lawmakers again fear a surge of new voters. Again, they want to rewrite election laws to limit participation. Their anti-voter bills would repeal same-day registration, shorten early voting, and Sunday voting, and more. The justification echoes that of the 1890s. Why? Because in past elections, there have been hundreds of voting irregularities. Cases of double voting, absentee voting, fraud. Yes, voter fraud. <laughs> Take a life. A statewide survey of votes cast in 2002 and 2004 found that out of 9,078,000 votes, there were four instances of fraud. <laughs> that a jaw dropping 44 one millionths of 1%. One <laughs> Most of our democracy is under siege from an enemy so small it could be hiding anywhere. <laughs> People have to push back and ask this kind of nonsense. We're, we're saying that these folks, the representatives in here, some of the leadership are out of control, out of control. It's a tool for them to reduce the number of eligible people that can vote. The groups that are affected, you know, in some ways it's the same groups that were affected 100 years ago. Voting in democracy at its core is about bringing more people in. That's what democracy in North Carolina is all about. North Carolina's anti-voter bills are hanging in the balance. History shows us that those who can seize the moment will shape our democracy for generations to come. Google, if you click on Google Chrome, it'll open. I thought I'd just take a moment. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has not read the Fourth Circuit's opinion from a couple of months ago, I highly recommend it. It's unusual for a court, a federal court in particular, to label a legislative act as racist. But that court did. And that is among the most conservative appellate courts in the country. So just think about what that signifies. It means judges who are not on the bench, subject to partisan pressures, 
looked at the evidence and determined that the North Carolina legislature intentionally tried to deprive, among others, blacks of the right and the opportunity to vote. It's a rather incredible document. And you know, it's one that I've, I've rarely seen that kind of language from a court, but it's in there, it's in the record. And it just exemplifies what this is all about. They're trying to restrict opportunities to vote, restrict those who have the chance to cast their ballots, as opposed to you know, what we should be doing, which is enlarging the electorate. They're trying to restrict it to people they like, not people of whom they're afraid. Um, so let me, uh, I'll turn it back over to Mel, but I just wanted to give that comment. Okay, so obviously that video happened before the law was passed in 2013, but it's going to show some context for what we're getting into here. So um, in 1965, after Bloody Sunday and a whole movement of people fighting for voting rights, Lyndon Johnson, um, uh, not super excitedly, <laughs> signed the Voting Rights law, um, Act into law. And there are multiple sections of that law that are important to know as we go into talking about North Carolina's law and what's happening now. So section two is really important. It prohibits discrimination of voting practices based on race, color, or language minority for certain languages. Um, and section four um, established that there are certain areas in the country where voting uh, suppression happens more um, a lot of those counties are actually on the eastern coast of North Carolina, northeast. Um, you'll hear a lot about discrimination happening there. Um, so with those counties, they put in some safeguards, right? So they put suspensions on any literacy tests for five years, and they did what was called preclearance. So any time a state was going to change their voting law, it had to go through federal approval process. Um, in 2004, in 2013, um, the Supreme Court struck down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, making it so that you didn't have to get preclearance for those certain counties and certain areas. So North Carolina, along with a lot of other states, passed voter suppression laws. North Carolina's was, of course, the very worst one in the entire country. So um, that law um, did a lot of damage and um, we're going to show these two videos, and then I'll go into exactly what happened with that law. These are pretty short. And then when this video ends, you just click the tab at the top, and then it'll cover. And then scroll down, sorry, and just hit play. It's just like a regular YouTube video, and it'll expand like that. Yeah. The right to vote is a right in your blood, paid for by the death and sacrifice. Voting in this is the reason that I carry a kiss. These same hands that once they cotton now get present. to increase participation. 
for example, standing or voting. That had really allowed the poor, the people who are working to jobs, to have options. Exit full screen. Um, in the same way you maximize, yeah. And then um, close the tab that this is under. The other, oh, there you go, yeah. Um, and hold on one second, and I want to say something before I start. Um, I'm going to say something, and then we'll play that one down at the bottom. Um, so the 2013 voter integrity law um, did a lot of things. And I'll show you the list here. I'm not going to go through it because it's like two and a half slides of individual items that have to do with uh, campaign finance and uh, voter restrictions. What we heard a lot was voter ID, voter ID, voter ID. 
Um, but like a lot of laws, there's a lot packed into it. So in addition to voter ID, some of the other things that were restricted were same day registration was cut, out of precinct in county voting was cut, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, straight party ticket, um, and they short shortened early voting period. So they took seven days away from early voting. Um, those are just some of the things that that law did, and those are the things that we have really were able to take to the Fourth Circuit um, and say, look at all this evidence that our poll monitors collected across the state, and look what this law is doing to people. And um, I heard when I was up there, yeah, like the Fourth Circuit came down and said, this is intentionally discriminatory, which is, um, very, very rare, if not unheard of, for the court. Usually they'll say something like, it has a discriminatory impact. Um, but to actually say the intent was discriminatory. They, we, the ACLU worked really hard um, on this and, and found memos that went back and forth between lawmakers saying what, what IDs are more likely to be used by people of color and what IDs are more likely to be used by white people and get the ones that were only used by white people um, to make them acceptable. So there was a lot that went into this that made it very clearly intentional uh, voter suppression. So um, the Fourth Circuit was a win for us. Um, depending on how the election goes, um, that can it might get appealed to the Supreme Court. We um, think it might be, but we are pretty happy with where we are for November. So in November, you won't have to have a voter ID. There is same day registration. There are seven days more of early voting. Um, so you'll see a lot of really good stuff. And um, this is a, a video um, of the victory, of the road to victory. And so I wanted to show this really fast and then um, we'll jump into more of like what folks can do. For everybody, Democrat, black, white, young, old, this is a
that life is necessary uh, here at North Carolina. So today, as it despite the, the, the um, very, very powerful evidence that with all of you, we presented in Winston-Salem, um, we got the decision in April, and it was a very big disappointment. But as we read it, we immediately saw the errors that would give us grounds to appeal. So today, all of us have been a steward step of taking this case to the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit here in Richmond and presenting it and asking the court to overturn the district court and to declare that the legislature that enacted House Bill 589 acted with intent to Movie with the music. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're in a really good place right now for the 2016 election. Um, again, tons of stuff. Um, no public financing options. Have you hit escape? And then um, go to the top where there's a uh, hit the X on that one. There we go. Yeah. And then go back to the first. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, of course, there's no public financing options, and it increased the contribution limits. Uh, for campaigns. Um, if you go to view, um, if you go to view at the top, <laughs> and where's the ACLU presentation? If you're writing it that. It's at the top left. Um, Yeah, and then, uh, okay, <laughs> and then we can get to the next slide. Yeah, um, so I'm just going to run through these, uh, but yeah, so this is one page of what it does, and then the next page is another page of what it does. Um, here, you'll see it. Um, Contribution limits to $5,000 and the limit for campaign contributions will increase every two years. Um, it repeals disclosure requirements of outside political spending under candidate specific communications. It reduces disclosure of electioneering communications. Um, it moves the primary. It uh, changes um, judicial public financing. Um, it makes it more difficult for satellite polling places, all kinds of stuff. And next. And it ended the stand by your ad law, which was a pioneered effort in North Carolina. Um, it required a candidate to say, I am this person and I approve this message. They don't have to do that anymore. Um, so here's another one. Uh, it, there is a provision that says that outside groups can spend unlimited amounts of money from virtually any source throughout the summer against a candidate without disclosing the source of amounts to the public. Um, it increased corporate money that can go to political party headquarters for uh, over, overhead costs. Um, and it raised contribution limits per election and um, for judicial candidates. So, and they raised it two year, every two years to keep up with inflation. So, there was a lot in this law. Anita Earls was gonna join us. She was 
Um, the attorney on this case, she's founder and executive director of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, but she was under the weather, so she couldn't um, attend today. Um, but she's awesome. Go look her up and her work. Um, okay, so this has impacted Mecklenburg County specifically a lot. So when there was a voter, when the voter integrity law was in place, they did come up with some ways to counteract the effects of it. And one of those ways was that, the, that each county had to have the same number of early voting hours in um, elections as they did in 2012. So you had to be able to provide in a shorter, in fewer days, the same amount of hours that you had in 2012. Uh, Mecklenburg was able to do this with 29 sites um, every day throughout early voting. Um, so, and that was really awesome. And it included UNCC, which was a battle. It's been an early voting site for 2008 and 2012, but there are party, um, party line hopes to not have campus sites. So we had to fight for that. Um, the chair said in that meeting in, in July, I don't think we need the Babies Ford Road library site. Um, it is underutilized. Um, so everybody, I think, gasped at that and the insinuations behind that, and she kind of let it slide. Um, and we ended up with a pretty good plan. We had all the hours we needed. Um, some counties across the state, state requested fewer hours than they had in 2012, which would have had to be approved by the State Board of Elections, but we had a really great plan. And then we had this awesome ruling by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, right? And everybody's really excited because no voter ID and same day registration. And then we realized that we don't have a guarantee of a minimum number of hours for early voting anymore. We don't have, we have a certain number of days, but we could have as few as one site during business hours and that would be at the Board of Elections. Some counties completely refused to meet and that would be the, um, the plan that it would go to immediately if they didn't if they didn't meet. So um, the chair of the local board of elections and the newspaper said that she was not a fan of early voting, and that she did not believe that we needed many hours. And so um, we got about 150 people to the board of elections, and she wanted to have it like Senate rules. Um, in July, in July. Um, Somebody, there was no time for public comment, but people were making comments anyway, and she allowed it. And then um, she started to talk, and then somebody would make a comment, and she screamed, I'm in charge here. Um, and the minority member, um, boards of elections have two members who are of the governor's party and one who is of the other party. So right now, all boards of elections are two Republicans and one Democrat across the state. So the minority member said, you know, I have a say too. Um, this is a voting body. Um, so she's like, well, that's not, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Um, so, so there was a definite tension. And then when we came back in July, she, she was very clear that she didn't believe we needed more than one site in the first week. Um, and not many sites at all in the second week. Um, and the minority members submitted a alternative plan to what they originally had. Um, and the State Board of Elections ended up giving us a compromise with 10 sites the first week and 21 sites the second week. So um, uh, the, the State Board of Elections actually said to Mecklenburg County, you are gonna be an example of what not to do. Um, there is no way that you can handle this many voters in your booming population with the few sites and hours that you have. Um, and again, the State Board of Elections is primarily Republican and they just said no way. Um, but counties across the state dealt with this. Dallas Woodhouse, the North Carolina chair of the uh, Republican chair, sent out a memo to boards of elections saying, cut early voting, this is where we can, we can win, cut early voting. Um, and and that, was, that was what was done. Uh, boards of elections are appointed by their local parties and they act in their party's interest. So, um, those memos were sent out and there was an attempt to cut early voting. The state board tried to err on the side of um, compromise and allowing people to have access. Um, and we did get a compromise in Mecklenburg County, um, but it's not gonna be enough. We're gonna see a lot of lines 
um, during early voting. So, um, but there's a lot of ways that you can get involved as advocates um, in our community that, that can help folks. So of course, register people to vote. Um, make sure that their voter registration is up to date with their address. And then we're gonna be phone banking. Um, we were supposed to start phone banking this week, but obviously um, we weren't able to do that. Um, volunteer to be election protection poll monitors. Um, we don't have as many red, uh, regulations to put into place, but who knows what could happen at this point at the polls. Um, we need people to go to these Board of Elections meetings that happen once a month. Um, this is where the boards decide that they want to make these supersized precincts, which means that they take out precincts and combine precincts together, um, make them really big. There's, there's a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of just kind of small things that these boards of elections can do that will greatly impact voting um, in November and October. Um, we have a program called Democracy Summer, which is built off of Moral Freedom Summer, um, which, was an which was an attempt in Mississippi that um, folks, white folks mostly registered people of color to vote. Um, and we have Democracy Summer that's based on that, where college students come and volunteer, and not volunteer, they're paid, but um, they, they have a stipend. And um, we always um, need uh, donations for that, I mean, for everything that we do. Um, Digital Democracy Defenders, if you're good at social media, go to our page, um, our Facebook page, get involved, share our posts, um, sign up online. You can sign up online to do any of this on our website at democracync.org. And we're going to be doing a massive Rise to the Polls program with organizations like the NAACP and the League of Women Voters that we're heading up. And we're able to give out many grants to organizations that are getting involved with that and able to donate a certain number of hours. Um, so that's what I've got. Um, do y'all have any questions? Yes. Would you mind repeating the question out there? If they, if they ask a question, because he's, he's Okay, sure. I was like, who's talking to me? <laughs> Is there any way to do what? Sure, I think there are lawsuits being considered and underway. Oh, the question was, is there any way to sue the Board of Elections? I'm sorry. <laughs> Beneficial things in it regarding voting hours. Right. They, so by, by overturning the statute but not accepting those portions of it that required they maintain the number of hours, the court inadvertently gave them an opening mm -hmm. to cut back the hours. That's, that's clearly contrary to what the court was trying to do, which is prevent them from cutting voting rights. But it's just they looked for every loophole and they happened to find one in the court's decision. And, and they did say that cutting early voting was part of a calculated um, attempt at suppressing the vote. So um, a lawsuit against the Board of Elections would probably be successful if, it, if, folks are, if counties continue to do what they're doing, which is to um, limit early voting. To be a Board of Elections oh, watch, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, she asked, what does it entail to be a Board of Elections watchdog? So this entails going to the meetings, um, and we have a, a really easy form that you fill out. Yes, they talked about this. Yes, they talked about this. It may be a little summary. Um, nothing too intensive. Um, they, they can wait up until 24 hours in advance to announce the meeting. So that's the tricky part, and they usually start at five in Mecklenburg. Some counties, they just post the notice on the front door of the Board of Elections and don't put it online or anything, um, and that's considered appropriate notice, but we don't live in that age anymore. I am urging folks to vote absentee ballot. Uh, Michael Dickerson is the executive director of the Board of Elections mm -hmm. in Mecklenburg County. Mm -hmm.
Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, oh, did you want to say something? I just want to repeat since she's not at the mic. So I'm repeating. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Um, and Anne's point recommending people avail themselves of the opportunity to cast votes, votes by absentee ballot uh, to avoid. They, for example, when they imposed a voter ID requirement, they imposed it for in-person voting, but not for absentee voting, which is actually where it's easier to commit fraud. So that's one of the examples of, that the court used to show why they were not being honest in giving the explanation of uh, the purpose of the law. Um, so an absentee ballot is very easy to use. It doesn't require you to come in with a photo ID. Uh, and actually, and it's just as effective when it's counted. But you have yes. To have yeah, you have to have witnesses, but it's still not not as burdensome. And Talk. oh, sorry, I want to I want to add yeah, to that the sure. dates for that. So, voter registration deadline is October 14th at 5 p.m. You have to be registered by then. November 1st, you have to have requested your absentee ballot. That's the application that Anna's talking about. That's the form. And then, obviously, you have to have your absentee turned in by November 8th. But you can already vote absentee. So you can, mm -hmm. yeah. The more folks who vote early, way early, the better the chances of having a reasonably fair election. Right, and um, and Michael does sit, Michael does vote those people early, so he or as they come in. So a lot of times, well, no, all the time, absentees are the first votes that are counted, a lot of people say, oh, they just count those if it's too close to call. No, they, they count those. In Mecklenburg County, they count those as soon as they come in. Um,